Okay, I've had some computer issues, forgive me. Okay, so we're gonna move on now, and we're gonna talk about something called a cumulative relative frequency plot, okay? So one thing you might wanna know is how can I go from a histogram to a cumulative frequency plot? This is why it's important to have a frequency table, okay? So when we wanna to go to a cumulative relative frequency graph, it displays the cumulative relative frequency of each class or bin of a frequency distribution. Again, remember, bins and classes are used um, interchangeably, okay? So what do we do is we have a sample size of 44, that means 44, the first 44 presidents were looked at and the age that they were in, the age at inauguration was recorded. So you can see they went by fives here, 40 to 44, 45 to 49, so on and so forth. And you can see the frequency. And then what I did is I went ahead, um, just to give you a friendly reminder on what relative frequency is, this relative frequency is not necessary for a cumulative frequency plot, but I wanted to give you just a little reminder. Again, this column right here is not necessary to make a cumulative relative frequency graph. However, I wanted to show you, okay, just to remind you what relative frequency was. So what we do is we take this two here and we divide it by the total of this column, which is 44, two divided by 44, and that gives us 0 0.0455, seven divided by 44, 0.1591, so on and so forth. So 4.55% of presidents, of the first 44 presidents, were between 40 and 44 at the time of inauguration, okay? What I'm gonna go ahead and do right now is I am just going to X this out because we don't care about this right now. Our goal is can we make a cumulative relative frequency graph? So what we need to do is we look at our frequency table and in my opinion, the easiest way to go about it is to add on two more columns to that frequency table. Cumulative frequency and then cumulative relative frequency. So what is cumulative frequency? Let's look at this row. We start here and we say, okay, from 40 to 44, two presidents were between 40 and 44 at the, eight, at the time of inauguration. Now cumulative means from the start. So 45 to 49, we're not gonna put seven here. We're gonna put nine, why? Because seven were from 45 to 49, but cumulative frequency means from the, the very beginning. The very beginning of our table starts at 40. So we have to start there. So we add two plus seven, that gives us nine, okay? Again, the next one we wanna know cumulatively how many presidents were up to the age of 54, okay, by the time of election. So that means they can, or inauguration. They can be anywhere from 40 to 54 at the time of inauguration, because now it's cumulative up until that point. So I had two plus seven plus 13, that gives me 22. Again, two plus seven plus 13 plus 12 gives me 34. Two plus seven plus 13 plus 12 plus seven gives me 41. And 41 plus three gives us 44. That's another way you can do it. Sometimes people do plot cumulative frequency plots, but more often than not, it's a cumulative relative frequency plot which means now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this column here and divide them all by 44, okay? Because I care about the cumulative frequency, cumulative relative frequency, not just the relative frequency. So you see relative frequency, where I took each one and divided by 44. Now I care about the cumulative relative frequency. So I look at this and I take two divided by 44, which is, 0 0.0455. Now I'm gonna take nine divided by 44. That gives us 0 0.2045. 22 divided by 44, 50%, so on and so forth. Okay, so now that I know how to get cumulative relative frequency, what I wanna do, okay, is I wanna know how to read this graph, okay? So let me quick access that I accidentally did that. So first of all, how did they plot this? Okay, so you see from 40 to 44, which is essentially because we're going by fives, like Instagram, 
from 40 to 45, we're going up by almost 5%, right? So that's where it said, hey, from 40 to 45, I increased by 4%. From 45 now to 49, I need to get up to the about the 20th percentile, okay, based off right here. So I go from this point, right, forty-five to forty-nine, 20th percentile approximately, right? Now from 50 to 55, I need to get up to the 50th percentile, okay? So from 50 to 55, I start right here where that dot is, okay? And I go from fifth from here all the way to the 50th percentile approximately. And I put a dot. Okay, so what am I doing right now? How I'm showing you how to plot this cumul cumulative relative frequency graph. I always start at zero, always, always, always. The first spin gives me four, uh, four to five ish percent. So I went up to where I think that I put a dot. The next bin, 45 to 49, which is essentially to 50, I go to 20% and put a dot. The next bin, 50 to 54, is at 50%, put a dot. The next spin, right, from 55 to 59, is up to 77%. So 55 to 59, which is 60. The next spin is up at to 93%, okay, which is approximately right here. And then I always end at 100. So that's how you graph a cumulative relative frequency table. You have the bins on the bottom and the cumulative relative frequency on the left, so x-axis, y-axis. And then you just look at the bins and you plot, always start at zero, okay? and you put the ending point there, like we did, and we connect the dots. Reflect over that for a second, make sure you know how to graph that. And now we wanna answer some questions about that. So what we need to do is we need to get a definition about what a percentile actually is, okay? So that's right here. A percentile, the pth percentile, so I'm gonna underline that, of a distribution is the value with p percent of observations, that are less than or equal to it. Well, you can read that, but let's put some context to it. So let's go back and let's look at this age at inauguration, right? So I have this first question, was Barack Obama, who was inaugurated at age 47, unusually young? So what we need to do is we need to read this table. So Barack Obama at age 47 was elected, okay? So we're gonna look approximately where is age 47. So age 47 is maybe about right here, okay? And I'm going to draw a line up until I hit my graph here. And I hit it just about there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line going over and I'm going to see where do I hit. Okay. I hit about right there. That looks about halfway between 0 to 20th percentile. So Barack Obama, was he unusually young? Here's what you need to learn from this. So let me rewind. If you're like, well, Miss Abel, what are you doing? Why are you reading the graph? In statistics, you need to learn this right now. When something is asked, is that unusual? We look at the percentage or the probability of that happening, okay? What percentile is that at? So when we're looking to see if something is unusually something, whatever they say, we're looking at the percentage. So we, that's why we went to 47, we went up, and we went over to see what his percentile is, okay? So I wrote a sentence down here, Barack Obama is approximately in the 10th percentile when it comes to the age at inauguration. This is not unusually young. How did I know that that's not unusually young? We're gonna learn a lot more about this. But for now, all you need to know is there's a benchmark in statistics, a general benchmark, 5%. If something is unusual, the percentile that is attached to it is 5% or lower. Otherwise, in statistics, it's not considered unusual. It's not an unusual event to happen, okay? So that's why Barack Obama being elected at 47 and being in the 10th percentile is not an unusual age to be elected. If it was at the fifth percentile or lower, then it's unusual. What should we have learned right now? 
how to read the graph, and, and knowing that when you're asked if something is unusual, you look at that percent attached to it, and you say, is it 5% or lower? Now this next one, estimate and interpret the 65th percentile of the, of the distribution. So we need to go and we need to look at the 65th percentile. So the 65th percentile, well, the 60th percentile is here, the 80th percentile is here, so the 70th is about there. So the 65th is approximately right here. So I go backwards now. I start over here on that y-axis, I go over, and now I wanna go down. So right in between 55 and 60, I'm gonna call it 57. So I estimated where the 65th percentile was. I went over and down. Age 57 is the approximate 65th percentile, which means 65% of presidents were elected at the age of 57 or younger than that, okay? And that goes to our definition of percentile. P percent of observations are less than or equal to that. And that's one definition you need to really have down pat. Okay, let's, okay. Right now, um, all I want to focus on is when you need to describe a distribution. So oftentimes what's going to happen on the AP exam is they're going to ask you to graph something or they'll give you a graph and they will say describe the distribution. And they're looking for four things in context when you're describing the distribution. So in statistics, one thing we need to learn is any time that we are um, describing anything or answering a question, it always needs to be in context. What does context mean? Context means telling the story behind that number, okay? You don't just say the average is 15. You say the average age of the people in the room is 15 years old, okay? So you tell the story behind that number. So when we're describing a distribution, um, I use socks. Mr. Jans uses socks. Some of you will go into Mr. Jans's class um, next semester. So just so you know, he does use a little different term, not the end of the world, okay? When we describe a distribution, we need to use socks. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to draw a table with me, okay? So it's gonna look like this. Okay, um, sorry for those of you using pen, okay? You want to have, oh no, a row for S, four, O, C, and S. Again, what are we doing here? Anytime you're asked to describe a distribution, you need to use socks in context. So what does socks mean, okay? The S stands for you need to describe the shape of the distribution. Now the shape can be one of two things. The shape can either be symmetric or it can be skewed, okay? So what does that mean to be symmetric versus skewed? I'm going to go back to my previous slide. That's my notes from last year. It looked a little messy, so that's why I want to start on a clean page with you guys. But so you can see a picture of what a symmetric distribution looks like compared to a skewed distribution. So here is a symmetric dot plot. It's nice if you draw a line down the center, right? Fold it in half, you'd be totally match up perfectly. Now, in statistics, nothing is ever perfect, okay? But if it matches up pretty well, you know, it's not perfect, but pretty well, that is considered a symmetric distribution, or sometimes in statistics, we call it symmetric enough. Now, if you have a skewed distribution, one of two things can happen. It can be skewed right or skewed left. And how you decide if it's skewed right or skewed left is you look at kind of where the thin part is, right? Where there's not a lot of observations. And actually in statistics, we call that the tail, right? If you imagine a dog with the tail, the tail's real thin compared to the body, okay? So if you look over here, this one is called skewed right because this tail over here is real thin on the right-hand side of the graph versus skewed left, okay, right? On the left-hand side of the graph. So shape, socks, 
Whenever you ask to describe a distribution, ass, shape, symmetric, or skew. The next one is called outliers. And that includes gaps as well, or just extreme observations. Now, a symmetric distribution can have gaps or extreme observations, as well as a skewed distribution. So what I want to do right now is I want to show you some pictures of, of dot plots that have gaps in it or extreme observations or potential outliers. We can't necessarily say something's an outlier until we prove it's an outlier, but we can state that might be a potential outlier. So let me give you a couple pictures of when you're describing a distribution. So rewind in case you're overwhelmed. You will either be given a graph or you'll be given, um, you'll be asked to graph something. Then you'll be asked to describe it. You use socks. You look at the shape to describe it. You look at and see if there is any outliers, meaning gaps or any extreme observations as well. So what's the difference? Let's look at them. Okay, so you can see right here, I do have a nice symmetric distribution up here. You see that? If I drew a line, these would match up right with these. But you can see with our data, our data, you could say, hey, maybe this starts at one, whoops, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So our data goes from one to eight. But there's a gap between three and six, okay? These are not outliers. Why are they not outliers? Well, let's talk about a potential outlier. Here now we have data right in here, right? Here's where the majority of our data is. We do have a symmetric distribution. You see we have an X here and an X here. But you'll notice there's a very big gap here with only one observation. An outlier is kind of like the lonely observation just hanging out by itself. Maybe there's one other person out there as well, okay, or observation out there as well, but it's pretty lonely, okay? So this observation right here would be a potential outlier. So would this one down here. This is also a potential outlier. So when we're looking at a graph, we say, is it symmetric or skewed? And then we say, is there any gaps or potential outliers. So you can see here over here is a skewed right distribution. And here I would say would be a potential outlier. Again, we won't say there's a big gap. We don't have to say there's a gap if we consider this an outlier. We only have to say there's a gap if we have a bunch of observations, gap, bunch of observations, okay? So this one's a potential outlier because it's lonely. And we're gonna practice this together here in a second. Let's go to the next letter, C. When you're looking at the graph, you have to decide what is the center of that distribution. The center means if you could pick one number or a couple numbers in general to describe what's going on with the whole group, that's the center. Hopefully you're thinking right now, Ms. Opal, do you mean the average? That's exactly what I mean. But when a distribution is symmetric versus skewed, we don't always use the average, okay? We're gonna talk about why in our next video, not in this lesson, but why that is in our next lesson. But for now, I want it down in your notes. Okay, so when we talk about center, if we are dealing with a symmetric distribution, we always note the mean. We find the mean to describe that, that distribution. The mean is the appropriate use of center for a symmetric distribution. If we have a skewed distribution and we're describing the center, we wanna use the median. And I'm gonna teach you how to calculate all this in tomorrow's lesson, okay? So the median is the appropriate measure of center for a skewed distribution. We have our shape, we have our outliers, we have our center, and now we have our spread, okay? Spread is a way to describe how spread out the scores are. We kind of want to know, like, I could have an average of 80% in my class. But if some people are getting 100% and some people are getting 50%, that's a big spread. That tells a lot about my class and maybe my teaching. 
Or what if I had an average of 90% and a spread of, sorry, my daughter just knocked on the, on the table. Okay, so the spread is a way that we describe how spread the, how things are. And again, I'm gonna get more into this in tomorrow's lesson. But for today, all you need to know is how to describe a distribution using socks and what that means. And we're gonna practice that together in a second, okay? So for spread, the standard deviation is the appropriate measure of spread for a symmetric distribution. Now, if you're only given a graph, the range is okay as well, the max minus the min, and that's the next example I'm gonna talk about. And the appropriate measure of spread for a skewed distribution is the IQR. And again, we don't have time tomorrow, we're already kind of getting long on the lesson right now. Um, we really, the IQR is the appropriate measure of spread for a skewed distribution. Again, you can always use the range if it's not easily, you can't easily calculate that IQR. And I'm gonna teach you how to calculate all this tomorrow. But for now, you need this in your notes. The last thing I wanna do with you today is I wanna actually look at two distributions, okay? And I want to talk about how would we compare these distributions, okay? AP is huge in comparing distributions. So what we need to do is we need to use socks to compare the distributions, but we also have to, have to, have to use comparison words. What do I mean by that, okay? The distribution of protein one, let's talk about S first from socks. Shape is symmetric, okay? Now, is it perfectly symmetric? No, it's not perfectly symmetric, okay? But it looks pretty good, okay? It looks pretty good. Now, whereas the distribution for protein two is skewed, right? How did I know it was skewed right? I knew it was skewed right because the tail, the thinner part is on the right hand side. Okay. One second, I made an error there. Okay, now let's talk about the center. Okay, again, what are we doing just to rewind? What I just did is I just paused and I changed these numbers to 12,000, 14,000, and 16,000. Because if you notice right here, it says these are all times 10 to the fourth power. So it was in scientific notation where this one wasn't. So I wanted them with the same, um, represented the same way, I guess, okay? So what is my goal right now? What am I doing? I'm comparing two distributions. And whenever we compare or describe distributions, we need to use SOCS, S-O-C-S. First is shape. The distribution of protein one is symmetric, whereas the distribution, okay, for protein two is skewed right. Next, center. I need to estimate the center right now, and I'm going to teach you how to do it more, more spe specific or cleaner on the next one, and as you practice this, you'll get very good at it, okay? Now, in a symmetric distribution, it's really easy to describe the mean, okay? It's really easy to describe or pick a center. Now, this is where kids can sometimes struggle in AP stats at the beginning because they want real firm, like right or wrong answers. And we're gonna just approximate right now where we think the center of this distribution is, okay? So the center of this distribution right now, I would say is around 14,000. It's real symmetric. And whenever things are symmetric, the center is right there in the middle, four, okay, on that line of symmetry, approximately, okay? So if I think the center, I'm gonna just write that over here. The center is approximately 14,000. Now on a skewed distribution, this is more difficult. And I don't wanna be jumping ahead of ourselves too much, but I do think you should know some things and it will help with tomorrow's lesson as well. If you look at this skewed distribution, you're going to learn that the mean chases the outliers, okay? So the mean here is going to be greater than the median. Right now, I don't care what you pick, okay? I would say that the mean of this distribution, okay, the average, 
is probably around, let's see, they're going, oh, what are they going by? This is 500. Jeez, I don't know. Let's say it's around 750, okay? So the center for this one is around 750, we're gonna say. And you gotta be okay with the uncomfortable here, guys. Okay, so what am I gonna say right now? I'm just approximating right now because I have no way of calculating what this is, right? The center for protein one is greater than the center for protein two. I'm using socks, S-O-C-S, -S, okay? And I'm using comparison words. The center for protein one is greater than the center for protein two. Did I need to write what I thought they were? No, you don't need to do that. You just need to know what they are and that you can tell one is bigger than the other. Now let's talk about the spread, okay? The spread, we wanna use either the standard deviation or the IQR, but we can't right now because we don't have those calculations. We don't know what the data is. We only have the graph. We can't figure out what the standard deviation or the IQR is at this moment, okay? But we can estimate the range, okay? We can estimate the range. So it looks like this bar is about 16,000. So 16,000 max minus 12,000 is 4,000. Whereas this looks like it's almost at 2,000, okay? 2,000 minus zero is 2,000. So 16,000 minus 12,000, that's 4,000 versus 2,000. The spread, okay, of distribution one is also greater than the spread of this one. Even though it doesn't look as spread out, you have to actually do a little bit of a calculation there, max minus min, and you can see, wow, 4,000 versus not even 2,000, that spread is bigger. So we're gonna just say the spread for protein one is greater than the spread of protein two. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this look a little nicer. And I'm wondering if any of you have noticed that I left something out. When I am comparing, I wanna use socks and in comparison words. S, the shape, I talked about the shape. Oh, I did not talk about the outliers. Sometimes in my, I like to do O last, but it doesn't matter. C is the center, S is the spread. Are there any outliers or gaps? No. There are no outliers or gaps that we can see on the graphs. Okay, guys, we just compared two distributions. It's a long one, I'm so sorry, but you guys got this, okay? All right, guys, we are I was just looking at the rest of the slides and seeing, hey, we have, we have done our business today. We are good. We have done a lot. So um, we will meet back the next day. And you guys, good luck with everything. Start of school. Um, have a great day.